Hello friends of Shadow to Self podcast. Are you enjoying that this podcast is now video 2? I hope you are enjoying it as much as I am. And for this very special episode of Shadow to Self, I'm sitting down with a beautiful teacher, author, grandfather, and I'm proud to say and privileged to have him as a friend of mine. David Nickton, founder and CEO of Dharma Moon, is a senior Buddhist teacher who has been practicing and teaching meditation for over 40 years. In fact, he was one of the initial American students of renowned Tibetan Buddhist meditation master Shogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. and he studied closely with him in his inner circle of students soon after his arrival in the united states in 1970 and that's a big deal he has been featured in the new york times fox news netflix's the midnight gospel a regular contributor to huffington post um the buddhist geeks podcast the duncan trussell family hour podcast you made it weird podcast with pete holmes and many others david also hosts his own podcast based on his book creativity spirituality and making a buck and i had the honor of engaging with him on his podcast and we we'll leave a link to that podcast in the notes below David is also the author of the critically acclaimed book Awakening from the Daydream which I have been enjoying very much by the way also reimagining the buddha's wheel of life actually this is the one uh, that we're going to talk more about also in this um opportunity to communicate and dialogue more about this waking up from the daydream and what's it about um and of course he has written creativity spirituality and making a buck um david is a strong advocate of integrating spiritual practice creating expression and everyday life he mentors individual students both in person and online he leads meditation teacher training programs around the world through his platform dharma moon which you can find at dharmamoon.com there is another beautiful side to this profound teacher who is really radiating that special bodhisattva chitta that special uh, psyche that's illumin he's also a celebrated musician a composer a producer and a guitarist as well as the founder of dharma moon records and five point records david has recorded and played with stevie wonder jerry garcia lana del rey maria um moldar paul simon and many others i might have murdered a few names but i think you get the gist of the level at which our beautiful teacher has been manifesting creativity among his many credits and records film and tv he wrote the classic song midnight at the oasis and composed a score for christopher guest's film the big picture in recent years he has produced multiple records for and periodically tours with grammy nominated kirtanwala krishna das If you are as excited as I am to get into this conversation with David then grab a cup of tea or warm water maybe a soft blanket to cover your knees settle down put a pillow behind you and welcome join our conversation David you are anchored but unstuck you're anchored in the deep deep buddha state of your being you're not just a teacher of it you're living it because 
what is the most evident aspect of that to me, to my eyes, is that you are unstuck. To 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 live with Buddha's teachings in this world is not just about sitting serenely under the tree because that's something you do for a while. But then you become dynamic like the Buddha till his late 80s, changing the world. And I personally feel that through your body of work, you're really demonstrating this ideal of being anchored but unstuck. And we came up with, with this term when we were just laughing and chatting informally another day, another time under the sun. But it really stuck with me. And I felt like I wanted to explore this theme and hope that our listeners and our viewers will walk away with some kind of divine permission from David Nickton and Acharya Shunya in conversation that that really is what spirituality is all about, whether we talk about the Buddhist spirituality or the Vedic, it does not matter because the essence ultimately is to be able to play some music. So please <laughs> tell us. <laughs> oh, goodness. First of all, I just have to say that is the best introduction I've ever had, period, over and out in this lifetime. So thank you for that. And second, I want to just quickly note that even whether or not the pronunciation of XYZ was perfect or not, the pronunciation of Buddha as you said it, I actually heard my teacher's voice in my head saying, that's how you're supposed to say that word. <laughs> because he would make fun of us, like people were from Texas and stuff. Like, yeah, I'm going up and studying with the Buddha, you know. So you have a fan in cyberspace here for that beautiful um, uh, and, and kind of um, careful and carefree uh iteration and naming of the of the buddha and it's interesting to think who that is you know that's something that we're talking about really is what is that what does that mean why do we talk about it why are people interested <clears throat> so if we you know acharya shunya and i do what I call jamming, you know, in the music world, which is we don't really have any idea what's going to come up next on a certain level. But I thought it might be interesting just spontaneously to talk about the qualities of the Buddha. So we have the name, which is important, but what are the qualities of, of, of that? Um, and also from my perspective, um, these are not restricted to this individual who lived 2,500 years ago, these qualities. They're universal qualities of human beings. It's a, it's a royal inheritance that all human beings share. And I agree completely with Acharya Shinya that uh, how, whatever your path is towards manifesting, understanding those qualities, those inherent qualities, and manifesting them, uh, I personally like to think of myself as selling lemonade in, a, in, in, in the town square and somebody says, how do I get to, you know, Vedas? How do I get to, uh, you know, a, a, a deep understanding of my tradition that this is all uh, uh, potentially valid and it depends on the individual person and what resonates with them. So that's a very important thing to say is none of these ways are either right, wrong or absolute or definitive. They're, they're, they're not meant to be. That is so true. I, I feel that I feel that there is no absolute truth, but then when we seek it within us, I think if it can allow us, and I'm going back to that same statement that I began with, if it can allow us to be anchored in something deeper and be able to emerge and engage in the world um, from a from a lighter space, but a place of inner presence. Probably, do you think we are coming close to the Buddha nature if the Buddha is 
really representing that enlightened awareness within us? Do you think enlightened awareness wanted us to be sober? Or did it, or, or and, and, and not to say that that is exclusive of sobriety, is exclusive of playfulness, or did the Buddha nature want us to be playful, or did it want us to bring both? What was your journey like with exploring being this traditional disciple of a traditional teacher? I'm sure the Rinpoche asked you to sit for long hours with your spine straight <laughs> on, <laughs> on the ground, you know, meditating for hours on end. And, and then you would come back home as the American really young kid, you know, just you were just growing up when you discovered your guru, your teacher. And, um, you know, your your background was making music, jamming with probably kids in your neighborhood at that point. How did this all how did you bring it all together? And I'm asking that because a lot of the listeners are my students or disciples and or listeners or readers. And I wonder if they think that I'm always sitting in the lotus pose, oming. <laughs> like, how do we, how do we, what are your thoughts on being able to to bring your journey into some kind of cognitive harmony with the Buddha being in your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so many little points to launch from in, in, in what you just said. Um, so for the first one is absolute truth. Actually, we Buddhists do say there is such a thing as absolute truth, which in Tibetan is called Duntam. And, and then there's um, also relative truth, which is called Kunsap. Kunsap means all dressed up, like, you know, you're ready to go to the party, you, get, you put your outfit on, and you participate in, in, in the life as it unfolds. But there's a third truth, which is not often as often spoken of, which is the inseparability of those two truths. So that, to me, is a key teaching. In other words, absolute truth is only absolute in the sense that it's unconditional. It's not based on causes and conditions. It's karma-free, if you want to put it that way. It just is what it is. Things are what they are. The relative truth is is relational. You know, how do we talk to people? How do, what, what's motivating us? Uh, what are we doing Thursday afternoon at 3.30? Are we picking up the kids at school? Is the car out of gas? Uh, you know, the myriad details of, of, of a finite existence. But putting those two truths together, you get this third one, which is inseparability of the two. And that is kind of my, uh, you know, I, I can't take it further than that at this point, that that is some kind of complete uh, portrait of, of, of existence. So the way I learned it, uh, was that you have to um, uh, manifest truth at both levels. In other words, you should be willing to have some kind of unconditional experience. Sit, You should sit and say Om for periods of time and not worry about where it's going or who told you to do it, but just fully experience that without causing conditions. And then you have to get up from the cushion and, and go bowling or whatever. <laughs> so, um, you know... Chanting home doesn't make you a good bowler necessarily. And being a good bowler doesn't necessarily clear, clear the way for you to have a kind of more ultimate understanding of what your life is about. So the two truths, that's what we talk about. Um, in my view of, you know, such as it is of the global religious thing and the materialistic world, there's a bias usually towards one or the other. Uh, and, and many of my spiritual friends and colleagues seem slightly biased towards the absolute truth or what they would perceive as a sort of broad vastness uh, and, and, but not accountability at the temporal level. And then the material world is just completely hung up in the temporal level. And there's no sense of anything underlying it or pervasive within it that um, has the quality of, as what you're saying of awareness and, and kind of primordial awareness or, or permanent awareness. So um yeah, that's my take on it, on that 
that first piece that you lobbed out there. That's so fascinating. And, and, and to be able to take a concept from the tradition and then to weave it into your life to say, yes, the pursuit of the absolute, the revolution of the absolute in my meditation is my quest. And yet I am a relative being with a relative life. And I have to take the absolute into the relative for support. And I have to bring the relative seeker in pursuit of the absolute. So there is, I love this third um, contemplation of the inseparability. That is a beautiful, I think, a very mature um, direction almost for us spiritual seekers. And interestingly, I will share with you that in the Vedic tradition too, we have the absolute truth known as um, the Paramarthika Satyam. Satyam is the word for truth and Paramarthika. And then we have the transactional truth, the relative truth. We have Harika. And then we have a third truth, but it's not the mixing of the two, which I think is a very advanced concept. But we have a third truth, which is kind of doing things in our mind, a very subjective delusion or reality weaver creator. So it's like my truth versus your truth <laughs> in a given shared transactional reality. But what we find in the traditional set up in the Vedic uh, ecosystem is that there are those who have reduced Vedic spirituality to only a relative rendering where mm. God has become the source for, um, please help me pass this entrance exam for my MBA. <laughs> or, um, oh, oh, Goddess Saraswati, please bless me so that my daughter gets married. And then we have the absolute teachers uh, of the Vedas who are meditating away. They have left the world behind and they are somewhere far away, uh, remote and inaccessible. And it is believed that they are still there. My lineage will benefit from the Buddhist concept of the inseparability. So I'm going to remember this. And mm -hmm. I hope my readers pay attention, my listeners pay attention to it, that these are inseparable. And that is where my lineage, a grihastha lineage or a householder lineage operates. We have houses or households in the relative truth. And yet we are placing the absolute and its search and quest and belief in our hearts. Mm -hmm. So I guess I join you there. Mm. So, yeah, I suspected as much um, the first time we spoke, and it's certainly gone on that way. Um, there's one other, uh, well, a couple, as long as we're tweaking this model, uh, uh, there's a couple of other things that might be worth uh, mentioning about it. Inseparable does not mean identical, but it also doesn't mean merged. So when we, the this is the middle way teachings, and they sum it up by saying not one and not two, because the the there's another school of Buddhism that actually kind of lost the debates back in, you know thousand years ago, that is all one. You know, it's all mind and it's all one. That's the Yogacara view, and so this is considered a slightly more refined view um, in terms of they're not merged, uh, they're not identical, but they're they're inseparable. So that, that's one aspect to it. And then the other one is, as you said, the third one. Uh, actually, there are two relative truths that are talked about. One is, and this has to do with unstuck. You know, you talked about anchored but unstuck. So if we're trying to get to that understanding. The, the third uh, aspect is the second aspect of relative truth, which is uh, if, if relative truth is kunsap, which means that it's relational and you, you recognize the costumes, the outfits, the thing. The second one's called Lokpi Kunzap in Tibetan, which means deranged relational truth. And that's what a lot of us are starting with, is a kind of like almost at the level of a hallucination of what's going on, based heavily on kleshas and habitual patterns. And we're just stuck there. So Lokpi Kunzap, you're really stuck. It's You're not unstuck at that level. 
relational truth, you could experience it without being stuck in it. And that's that's sort of and really if you look at the Buddha, he ate breakfast. You know, he, it's not like he went into turned into atmosphere. So um, you can experience relational truth without being stuck in it. But there's a further quality of as I'm sure this would be very similar of having developed certain obscurations and, and delusional patterns of thinking and feeling that, you know, really solidify you and gunk out your emotional life so that it's just a kind of like swampy kind of morass that you're kind of, you know, foraging your way through to get even a breath of fresh air. It doesn't have to be like that, but that's where practice comes in, right? Absolutely. That's where practice comes in. And, and I just had this, um, this idea of like eat breakfast, be enlightened, or be enlightened, <laughs> eat breakfast. You really put it, you that image of the Buddha eating breakfast is like something we need to bring into our minds in present day spiritual practice, I feel. Mm. I was wondering when you were talking about the path of not one, but not two in the middle path, is Nagarjuna an important contributor to your path from South yeah. India originally? Yeah, to totally. This all, all of these schools are, including the tantric schools. It just has to be stated clearly as a bell. Um, the, you know, Mahayana school completely evolved in India, maybe second century to eighth century. Uh, Nalanda University, great teachers that were, you know, um, you know, it was a, a real cultural um, May Day for a, a wonderful time for people studying this stuff and, and and comparing notes on it. But at the same time, and this is what I this this is what I like to say about my particular lineage, which is a tantric lineage from Tibet, that also started in India quite clearly. There's very clear lineage uh, declaration. Uh, my the Kagyu lineage started with a teacher named Tilopa, who was a crazy yogi. And, you know, really, we have a tradition of uh, of um, siddhas, mahasiddhas. It's, it's, it's really a mahasiddha lineage. And, it, you know, these stories are incredible, these lineage stories. But Tilopa had, um, was an archetype of a kind of free being, you know, who had mm -hmm. sort of some qualities of self-liberation. But his student, Naropa, who was a famous uh, um, mm -hmm. Buddhist teacher, was a kind of university professor type and had all the kind of knowledge and all the, and, and one day uh, this old hag who was actually a Dakini um, appears to him on campus. I like to think of this as Columbia College campus where I went and just says, you know, Naropa, do you understand the words of the teaching? Yes. Do you understand the sense? And he said, yes, but she mocked him. <laughs> And humiliated him basically, and then disappeared, which is what happens to anybody who really wants to practice this stuff. You have to be mocked, humiliated, and then that, that person disappears, and then you have to find your teacher. So he went out into the woods to try to find Tilopa. It took him 12 years. I don't know who would do that these days. And then another 12 years of studying with Tilopa and getting his head unwrapped around the concepts. You know, really, really, it was a very shocking experience. I can only imagine, uh, you know, what that is like but that is part of the tradition and then if you go a little further along the monastic tradition and the yogi tradition blended uh and, and um you know in tibet that became that what you have for the last 1200 years of m monastics who are tantrics that's a weird combo uh, and it, but it, it it is how the teachings got transported for, for the last 1,200 years primarily, but there were always some crazy yogis lurking on the sidelines. And there were also crazy yogis within the monastic tradition, very famous stories. I want to talk to you more about <laughs> your tantric lineage and about yogis becoming invisible and being transported, but I wanted to put this pin in there that I came across Nagarjuna, the founder of your lineage, through Ayurveda, because you you may be well aware that he was a teacher of Ayurveda alchemy and gave us formulas on converting mercury into gold. And I have met Vedyas, um, the traditional uh, Rasa Shastra or alchemical Vedyas in India, who are now very few, 
they were intergenerationally taught who consider Nagarjuna as the founder of this branch of Ayurveda. And I have seen them convert uh, a goblet of mercury into gold. Like I've seen them do that. Yeah. And uh, also there are formulas uh, which make which make a person invisible. There are alchemical mm -hmm. formulas in Ayurveda texts. It's also interesting that the Ayurvedic tradition, amongst the eight top siddhis, which all the gods are giving, like Sita, Hanumana, and all of them, the, Lakshmi, the, one of the top siddhi is to become invisible. But of course, it's not a random person cannot become invisible. You have to be a Siddha or Siddha blessed or God blessed, of course. And it's interesting that your conversations are sparking all these, all these like real tangible information in our scriptures uh, <laughs> of Nagarjuna bringing that kind of uh, magic almost mm -hmm. or tantric Siddha, you know, alchemical knowledge into mainstream Ayurveda. And mm -hmm. today he is known as the father or father of Ayurvedic alchemy known as Rasayana. Um, and also his influence brought um, worship of Buddha into the Ayurvedic tradition. So we have mm -hmm. uh, entire verses dedicated to the Buddha uh, praying to him uh, you know, we deified him and then we pray to him for health and well-being. And and there is one particular verse that you might find interesting and I'll be happy to email you a, a version of it, um, which says that you are the Apurva Vaidya, means you none have come before, you're the complete Vaidya and you destroyed the afflictions of your own mind. Uh, which is the root source, the root glaciers of all, you know, disease. And hence we pray to you that help us destroy the glaciers of our mind. So I thought I'd just throw it in there while we're having this delicious conversation. Yeah. And, and I want to go back, you can go wherever you want to, but I want to go back to having this middle path, which has connections with, the tantric understanding of Buddhism. And then you're this American um, seeker from uh, a time in America where uh, the, the Americans were ripe and open for input from the East. How did all this settle with you? How did you transform into the person you are today, into the teacher, into the presence that you have become today how does it all what's your alchemy david <laughs> <laughs> so you know one of my guiding principles at dharma moon we say principles not rules you know when we have our teacher training program and so forth principles not rules so one of the you know uh, uh, notable qualities about you know great teachers is they're able to say something quite simple and eloquent and repeatable. And this is sometimes called pith instructions, pith style of instruction. Um, so one a thing that Trungpa Rinpoche used to say is, um, first thought, best thought. And uh, I actually did a little YouTube t attempt to explain that, that the nature of, of the mind is non-thought, really. Essentially, the ground of awareness is not based on thought. If you're not thinking, you're still alive, you're still, you know, it's just a kind of um, secretion of the mind. You know, it's not the mind itself. So uh, first thought is the one that arises in, in the kind of clarity of that open space. And it's amazingly trustworthy most of the time. It's just incredible. And it's the source of poetry. It's the source of, of, of great insight. Um, and there are many, many lines in various sadhanas, you know, the nature of insight, which arises from space. Um, so it's not that you have to clear the mind or suppress the thoughts. They're just ground cover. You just have to become aware of the, of the space in which the thoughts are germinating and dissolving 
I think that's a big part of our meditation practice is about. And then first thought, best thought um, is, um, you know, when you said, how did you personally, me, David, get, you know, whatever process I have going on, I thought of being waterboarded, which I saw on a TV show last night. You know, now that's a torture that they have in the military where they hold you down and they just pour water into your mouth <laughs> and you kind of choke until you finally tell them what they want, want you to what to know. So, um, you know, it's a it's a classic kind of unfortunate uh, form of torture that is practiced in, in the military. So when you said that, I thought I've been waterboarded by these teachers. I'm not like a seeker. I don't think of myself as a seeker in a certain way. I'm just trying to make, go about my business on a certain level and get through a day like everybody else. But I had the karmas to to meet. Well, first of all, to meet Trungpa Rinpoche in particular, who was a seminal, seminal force in terms of Dharma, Tibetan Dharma coming to the West. And then he brought his friends along. So I never even went to Tibet or to India. I never, at that time, I've been since then, but I never had the occasion to go because these teachers kept landing. And we, as Trungpa Rinpoche students, had to learn how to host them. So we got both personal and sort of group class teachings from people like the 16th Karmapa, from Gilgo Kensei Rinpoche, from Kalu Rinpoche. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the teachers who are, are well known now, like I just saw a picture of Ponlap Rinpoche, who's a wonderful middle Tibetan Buddhist teacher, probably 50s or something like that. And he's a kid in the first time I saw him. You know, he's he was in Karmapa's entourage when they came in 1976. And I remember him from that. So I feel like I just, I'm trying to swallow as quickly as I can to, to get, you know, to avoid uh, choking and indigestion basically. Um, but I, I, I don't feel like I'm foraging through the woods to try to find this stuff. Usually not at all. It just lands on me like, like coconuts, you know, on my head. Well, we think that, uh, in the Vedic tradition, we think that this is fortunate, good, auspicious, shubha, karma of countless lifetimes that the teacher comes looking for you. and finds you in the middle of your relative existence to point you the way. And I, and I, and I personally feel deeply touched by your story. Mm. Yeah. I was shocked the first time I met Trungpa Rinpoche. Mm. Shocked. Because I was taking, I was going to Berkeley College of Music, studying mm -hmm. music. I, was into yoga at that time and was probably a little more, you know, kind of holistically healthy oriented, experimenting mm -hmm. with that, like so many people were. And he came to the yoga studio and he mm -hmm. gave a, a workshop, uh, which to my amazement was called Work, Sex and Money. That was the title of the first workshop I ever went to. Mm -hmm. And it's a book now that people can can read from taken from transcripts from those teachings. And he was so grounded. And actually, um, I walked home the first night that I met. He was in a business suit. He, was, he, had, he had taken off the robes quite a while before that. And I walked home on Marlboro Street in Boston, and I started laughing at myself because I said, you are so tripped out with all this spiritual stuff, and here's like a real master. He's completely grounded and completely ordinary and actually slightly boring. How fascinating that the grounded master needs no bells and whistles. Oh, he, well, he's life. the one who's he's the one who said Buddha Dharma without credentials. That was the first little magazine that we published, and he had credentials. So that's mm -hmm. it's one thing for somebody with credentials to say without credentials. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but he was. Look, here's the bottom line on this. As as for you, you've been thrown out of the nest, as far as I can tell. You, you, they hit the eject button, and you're now out in California, uh, without a rope, without, without a ladder. You just gotta like trust what you learned. Is that correct? Ejected out, or yes, definitely sent out of that close circle to say, go do your thing, but let it help the lineage, let it prosper the lineage. Definitely. So I have to trust my heart. I'm also on a mission to trust my heart. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good mission. Yeah. Um, 
it's it's um it's you know this is a big moment in in time that these traditional teachings from another culture are trying to find their way into a very different culture and you know Trung Trumuti was just ahead of the game in terms of trying to be very creative about how to translate things how to talk about things which would make uh, which would make sense to um to westerners you know so um i um i think for me along with being waterboarded i try to be very humble like you know i could always be wrong i could be missing a boat i could be missing the point um but i don't have that I have the basic core feeling that I think probably you do too, that the lineage has a lot of, um, a lot, a lot of, uh, authentic, uh, authenticating went on before I appeared at all. So I have a certain kind of trust in my teacher, even though he was extremely eccentric and unusual and, you know, uh, provocative and challenging in my gut. You now you talk about your heart. I like to go from my gut. That's that, I think my heart is in my gut. I, I think definitely, I think there is a outward recognition of the teacher by lineage, by credibility, by other badges. And then there is the gut heart recognition by the disciple. There is also this knowingness that I have been, in my case, I was born in my teacher's home. In your case, your teacher came looking for you. I remember as a child wanting to just really climb trees and have fun and not have to chant the Veda. But I was told to do that because somebody, somehow, some intelligence had a vision that I'm going to be the leader in my own right when I am of age or when I'm ripened as a being to give back to the world. I have the seeds to forward on. I'm not just needing the light, but I can give some light onwards. And it sometimes feels like there is a greater force, greater destiny. You use the word karma. And um, it's interesting that at the time I'm talking, I've just begun teaching a four-part series on karma, destiny, and the path of karma yoga for another organization. And uh, I have to say that again and again, I keep going back to karma because there were these these instincts in in me, or there were this shadow in me, and that's why the name of this podcast is Shadow to Self. There was mm. a very clear, definite shadow, and it was palpable. It was not. It was not. Everything I have is powerful, so my shadow was powerful too, and it wanted to sabotage my life. It wanted to um, seduce me into being reduced into shambles really through through my um through my own mind mm. the thoughts would come which would uh which would second guess everything mm. which would fill me with doubt but then again and again that's where a teacher of merit is important because when they speak to you that humbling happens it's not like somebody told you david become humble the knowledge humbles you. And yeah. so I would have all these monstrous shadowy doubts um, up the tree. But when I came down the tree, washed my face and hands, sat down with my spine straight, chanted and listened to my guru. That was the end of my shadow for the next mm. few hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord. It, but it was um... big. It was big, that shadow. Yeah, it, and people are. I'm going to Boone, North Carolina, to this to play with Krishna Das. Uh, when this podcast is broadcast, it will have already happened. Um, August 23rd to 28th, uh, the Ram Das um, Memorial Retreat, and somehow I got on a. It's it's actually they're talking about um, uh, uh, bhakti tradition and Buddhism. That's the theme for this retreat. So I'm actually, in addition to playing guitar, which is what I usually do, I'm giving some uh, talks and participating that way. And somehow I got on this uh, panel, just a couple of, I think just two of us, talking about the shadow. Uh, dark emotions, that's what they call it, dark emotions. Ooh, dark emotions. And I went like, I'm not sure I know what that is. 
to tell you the truth, I'm not sure I know what that is. I know what it's like to have unwanted emotions. That's what I, I could recognize. Or harmful emotions. Um, but to call them dark is not my style. It's just strong. You know, so uh, we, you know, we, we, in the tantric approach, we don't uh, try to, no longer trying to exercise th those powerful emotions. They are considered wisdom itself at the same time. It's called co-emergence. It's a very significant approach. They have the same energy. They have the same um, wisdom, but we don't have the proper relationship to them. That's really what's get, gets adjusted. So there's nothing that needs to be suppressed. That's not that's not the way. And, and I sometimes feel that my shadow that kept coming up was really me needing to integrate my own power, my own Shakti. And, and it's surprising that my guru chose me because I was never someone who didn't have her own opinion, her own thoughts. And I was clearly meant to be a world leader. And so early on, I had all this individuality. But now that individuality is aligned with a greater collective thought of my ancient 2000 year old lineage, that's good. But it still carries, as you mentioned, a, a, a very beautiful work that I have done, where initially when I didn't understand it, it's uncomfortable. And it must be, it something must be done to it. It must be doctored. But really, the journey is from shadow to self, not from not from holiness to self or pilgrimage to self or uh, a day at the spa to self. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the work begins in the shadow, and the work begins about integrating um, all those unknown parts of yourself. And and also those desires, uh, which which may or may not be validated by your tradition, but they are there for you and they are your truth. And what are you going to do about it? Are you going to lie about them? Mm. Are you going to be open about them? Or are you going to talk to your tradition and see where is, which part of the tradition, and I want to come to that, is, probably dogmatic and needs to go and which part of the tradition is truly awakened and needs to stay fortunately i found that a big part of my tradition is is awakened but i had yeah. to let go of the dogma of mm -hmm. rituals mm -hmm. and superstition mm -hmm. gender rules mm -hmm. um, patriarchy that was all kind of woven in in a very beautiful way, but no thank you. <laughs> mm. No yeah. thank you. And so Baba, my guru, used to say that she's not my uh, granddaughter sitting in the class. This is Devi Durga sitting in the class. So <laughs> everybody give her the reverence due to her. Mm. That's the journey. The shadow journey was, it was powerful. But now she has made myself even more powerful. Mm. That's a we're having a powerful conversation here, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's um so many you know thoughts that come up around this, but in essence, um the view, you know, we talk about the view and the practice and the result. It's kind of a threefold process. And the view is different for different practices. Like, for example, the Theravadan or the Hinayana view is to begin to tame the mind and settle it down and develop focus and concentration, which is important because otherwise it's scrambled eggs for, for, uh, for, you know, you can't even process anything. Then the next view in the Mahayana is compassion uh, exchanging self for others so that you you don't get all stuck in your own uh, process of becoming more realized, more enlightened, but you spread it out immediately. You throw it out immediately. You offer it up immediately. But since what combines, what really connects our two traditions, and I've talked 
with all of my bhakti friends about this extensively. I, and I think I've said this to you before, that my tradition has clear connections with when they have a Theravadan teacher or a, a you know, insight meditation teacher or a Zen teacher. There are commonalities that are very powerful there. But, but my tradition also has commonalities with other tantric traditions that emanate from India, uh, in which the view is very simply that the nature of the being is already established in, in basic goodness or in Buddha nature. It's already been done. You, you don't have to do that. There's no job there. But you have to remove the obscurations. And that, so all the practices are clearing away. So there is no shadow, essentially, because all the landscape has been cleared away. There is just the ground. And it could express itself based on, it could look like, uh, it could look like the emotions that we think of as negative, but they're purified. And they're uh, in sync with the other two yanas, that there's discipline, and then there's also a sense of um, serving others from that perspective. So the slip in the tantra is it becomes like the cities you mentioned. You start playing with that stuff. And that's really prohibitive. To, to try to develop cities for their own sake, becoming invisible or becoming, uh, you know, levitating, whatever, is considered a side trap if you don't have the ground of the discipline and the Mahayana uh, offering. So, um, but the view is pure, it's, fun, it's called kadak, fundamental purity, intrinsic purity. It's already there, there's no job, you don't have to work, you just have to kind of recognize it. The practice is recognizing that. Does that make any sense? Totally. And it, it's so remarkable that traditions emanating from India have have this basic worldview. The, the terms may be different, the practices may be different, but the whole premise of um, the mind having uh, three gunas or qualities, and you know those, sattva, rajas, tamas, where sattva is the original quality of illumination and purity. And, and, and even another word is nirmalta, blemishlessness. And mm. it's only covered over by distracting rajas, like a discotheque of thoughts, and <laughs> and 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 tamas, like a veil draw, created by heavy curtains, mm. which work in synchronicity to 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 become the shadow. Uh, rajas distracts the mind outwards through the senses, and uh, because and 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 tamas veils the light so when we don't find the light inside us we go looking for it outside in relationships or drugs or or the wrong version of it you know the wrong version of the world the distorted version of the world the grabbing graspy version of the world but to be able to return to sattva is really returning to our pure mind and what was the name for that in Tibetan Buddhism? Uh, well, a lot of names. I mean, that would be basically be Dharmakaya. Dharmakaya, right? oh, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And it's interesting that sattva is connected to dharma. And so it is said that whether you know Sanskrit or not, whether you have a teacher or not, that Dharmakaya, dharma, would become revealed in the pure mind. But until that rajas and tamas or those sediments are um, clouding up the view, well, beautiful words, until we are, it's clouding up the view as it was when I was first born, um, there can be this danger of becoming this or that and even walking away from your destiny, your, mm -hmm. your karmic alignment. And my karmic alignment begins and ends with this lineage, this work I'm doing mm. with the Vedas. And this is where I have blossomed. Mm. And 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 but they but for a while there these these the shadowy version of it took me away. But mm. then in hearing my guru and I don't know, this must be the grace of Divine Mother because I'm her devotee that I sat with it and looked at what I looked at what needs to be discarded. Like, what's just nonsense? <laughs> what's <laughs> plain out delusion? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and what is that emotion that needs attention? Yeah. And I think in the Tantra, there is this, and remind, please clarify it for me, but there is these emotional archetypes that of these beings that represent the more um, intense emotions that then get converted. Is there, am I, Am I remembering something correctly from some iconography I've seen? Or am I off? Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, there's um, the basic idea here is, I think, that we're tacking on is the sort of, let's say, the neurotic manifestation of a certain energy and the more, uh, you know, let's say, realized or enlightened. There you go. There, That's where co-emergence comes in. Of the same co-emergence. Got it. They, they arise simultaneously. In, mm. in, in the mind and then due to our, our obscurations and our habits we lean towards the you know kind of well for example take falling in love or passion or something like that we lean towards the grasping and the manipulation and the kind of dissatisfaction mm. and the like if only this person xyz and on the other side of it uh there's this sense of you know incredible attraction uh feeling connected feeling compassionate feeling you know inspired um, and and without any you know any of the classic dimension of it, then they're considered to be co-arising. So depending on our training and our orientation, uh, the one the, we get stuck with one, and the other is not uh, sticky. One one is sticky, the other feels flowing. You know, would be the way I would say it. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, and I believe now I'm remembering the artwork from the King of Burma's Palace. Where which had come on an exhibition to um, to San Francisco, and there was all these beautiful mandalas and artworks of the co-emergent deities mm. representing mm. the polar opposites, and you could mm. see the peaceful face of the deity and the distorted face of the deity. Well, that might be something in addition, because there are. A pantheon of deities in the um, Tibetan Buddhist and, and you know mm-hmm. Indian Buddhist really comes from there, mm-hmm. which is peaceful and wrathful deities. Peaceful and wrathful. Yes. That's different. That they, those are all considered to be expressions of enlightened mind. Even the mm-hmm. wrathful ones are not. They're not trying to portray anger or. But you you could look at them. And you could go. Well, why is that and a deity so fierce and they have weapons and stuff? It's to cut through because we're so dull. So the, the wrathful ones are not uh, distortions in, in an emotional sense. They're more like a how does the world communicate to us uh, skillfully, sometimes by being, you know, settling and, you know, pacifying and sometimes by interrupting our flow. And a good teacher should be able to manifest peaceful and wrathful. Uh, but they're both considered enlightened aspects of enlightenment in that case. So whole, so beautiful and I hope the readers of Roar Like a Goddess are seeing how the goddess need not always be peaceful and benign, but she's wrathful and and raging, and she's really demonstrating the twin opposites of this universe. So that's that's really beautiful. That brings me to your book where you um, talk about the uh, the tree of life. And I wanted to briefly go there before we wind up because you have presented the mandala of the six spheres of existence in the whole universe, if we like to put it, or or the six states of the psyche. Mm. And uh, you have done, I have to say, an excellent job. And I think it can really help people navigate their own mind um, can you just remind me the name of the book again? Because though I'm reading it, the title is not in front of me. That's okay. Yeah, it's called Awakening from the Daydream, Reimagining the Buddha's Wheel of Life, which is a classic uh, iconography that's on the outer wall of most temples uh, because it's for lay people. The teaching is sort of oriented towards lay people. And um, the six realms are the six lokas. This is from purely from Indian, uh, I, you know, um, cosmology they're considered uh real places with real landscapes like brooklyn <laughs> you know would be uh but they're also considered states of mind 
And in the book, I talk more about the the state of mind of feeling like you're in hell or feeling like you're you know having a sublime deva like uh, afternoon, and that we as humans we can access all six realms, um, not by embodying them completely, but by uh, passing through them or getting stuck in them, which which happens. So they're basically the god realm, the jealous god realm, the human realm, the animal realm. The pr- pretas are uh, hungry ghosts, um, and then the hell realms, which are all everybody has been in every one of those. Anybody listening to this could probably just read a brief description and say, "Yeah, I know what that feels like." But if you're serious enough about knowing what that feels like, you could be born into that realm. <laughs> you could be born as a turtle, you know, or an ostrich, or um, you know, uh, in a sublime place that feels permanent but isn't. And so what realm is Earth then? Is it the human realm? All of it. Oh, all of it. Yes, if we go through the psychology model, it's all yes. of it. And if we go through the actual like, yes. dimensions. That's a great question because supposedly all six realms have real loci. You know, they have some temp- temporal tangible existence. But for oh. us as human as human beings, we can access and see the human realm, obviously, and the animal realm. And some realm. some of us probably can see pretas on a on a foggy night. You know the ghosts. Um, we might have you know sort of a sense of the devas, you know, sort of flittering around or or not. The uh, angels, yeah, yeah, angels or whatever. But the, the tangible realms for us are human and animal. That's that most of the beings we know are like in one of those kind of bodies. Well, I wanted to put a plug in that this book is um, deeply insightful. And for students of mine who have been talking about the locus, but I don't have a book out yet yet, or clarity on any written piece, I think this is a great book to just begin um, understanding that there are these states of mind and that you can watch your own self crash down to the hellish plane, which David describes as a place of great in um, torrential <laughs> darkness and <laughs> almost psychological suffering, would you say, mm. David? Yeah. Yeah. And either there's hot hells and cold hells. And roughly speaking, the cold hells is depression. The hot hells is aggression. Aggression. Right? So outer and, or inner. and it's mindless and relentless depression. Rel- and relentless. That's Unless you pick yourself up, and I mean, the journey can be all the way to the God realm. And then in the hungry ghost realm, we just become, uh, we're never enough, kind of, isn't it? Yeah, it's like we're right. always relentlessly seeking. Yeah. In the realm of competition, um, we are uh, we we are getting there, we're becoming enough, but now we are jealous, or we're just competing with others. Yeah. It's Hollywood in Washington, D.C. Hollywood in Washington, D.C. Yeah, this is (laughs) such a beautiful teaching. Thank you for this book. And I I can't wait to dive into more of your books. Thank you. Perhaps this is a time to bring our conversation that has gone where it needed to go. Because we are enjoying this karmic moment of togetherness and sharing it with um, lots and lots of like-minded folks in our realm, where we are. And I believe we are all the time in godly realms. It feels Mm. like that because we feel inwardly anchored and outwardly we are unstuck. Any last words to our listeners on this ability or this journey or this goal? Yeah, first of all, thank you, Acharya Shunya, for um, basically there's nothing more than we can offer than our body, speech, and mind. And your offering feels very complete because you're putting it out on the table and and letting people, um, you know, come be with you and spend time with you and challenge and be challenged. So this is very rare. I really appreciate it that we can have this kind of authentic but fluid conversation. It's rare. I mean, it's just very precious to me. So I want to thank you for, the, for for having this. And the other thing I want to invite our, our guests, if they're interested, um, 
that at Dharma, just go to dharmamoon.com if you want to find out what we're offering in terms of teachings, Buddhist teachings and so forth. And also that we have our sort of signature program, which is a hundred hour mindfulness meditation teacher training program that starts October 13th. And um, that's a great opportunity for anybody who wants to go a little bit deeper, stabilize their practice and learn how to communicate it well to others. And you, you can find out about info sessions for that and how to register for that at dharmamoon.com. So please come and visit us and let us know if you have any questions. And then finally, um, uh, I'll, I'll leave the people with the um, another meme from my teacher. Your guess is as good as mine. <clears throat> That's an important attitude to take. Uh, even with your teachers, we say your guess is as good as mine. You can't just take somebody's word for this stuff. You have to put your butt on the cushion and your ass on the line to, to find out for yourself. And that's what Buddha taught. That's what I'm trying to do. That's what my teacher taught me. And it feels like that's what your um, dharma is like to um, Charya Shunya. So I, I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David. And yes, dear listeners, supporters, fans of Shadow to Self, thank you for your all five-star review. Thank you for making Shadow to Self a top 2.5% uh, percent, um, category podcast. And wow. we'll just keep coming back to you with um, more guests who I can beautifully jam with. Very select, <laughs> very select people like David, mm. who you will keep meeting here. And of course, I'll keep coming back with my truth. For a while there, I had stopped recording just for a few weeks because I had told you that I'm needing to find my voice again. I'll record another podcast about that later. But you can see that my voice is back. Sometimes you just have to chat with like-minded folks. Mm -hmm. So for that, I'm grateful to David and grateful to all of you. And please write us your comments on how you benefited from this um, episode how did you like it please share please subscribe and do visit david's website because his body of work and the sheer groundedness and unstuckedness that he brings to the ancient buddhist tradition is remarkable we are all the better for teachers like david in the world thank you again david and this is uh, Acharya Shunya. Until next time.